So uh, thank you ever so much for having me to speak this afternoon. Uh, this would have actually been my first uh, bio law conference, so I'm delighted to take part virtually and I hope to take part uh, in the future uh, in person. Uh, my name's Liz Edwards Waller and I'm based at the Squire Law Library uh, in the University of Cambridge. And I'm going to delve into the mysterious world of code breaking and escape rooms this afternoon. So like any good mystery, I'd just like to start with setting the scene. The Squire Law Library primarily uh, supports the staff and students of the Faculty of Law at Cambridge. The library is embedded in the faculty and occupies the top three floors of the building where lectures and group teaching also take place. The Squire has one of the uh, largest academic uh, law collections in the UK and the faculty has 900 students uh, thereabouts, including undergraduate, taught masters and PhD students. And we have a large cohort of international students. Traditionally, the LLM programme attracts students from around 50 different countries each year, and they will have had a very different experience of previous study. When we're thinking about the importance of orientations and welcome events for students, it's important for us to bear in mind that in any given year, around 46% of the law students we're supporting will be new uh, to the building and the university. Uh, and about half of those new students are on an intensive nine month master's programme. So they have very little time and a huge number of resources to get to grips with. So what do we do normally by way of our orientations? Well, it may of course be somewhat different uh, this year, but traditionally uh, the librarian or members of the library team will present to students in a welcome lecture and then we welcome students for tours of the library, normally in groups of five to 25 students and we'd expect to run around 40 tours during Freshers' Week, so it's a very busy time for us. So why think about running an escape room or a code sort of breaking event in addition to, or perhaps sometimes instead of, a more traditional library tour. Well, firstly, we know that most students attend welcome lectures and library tours, but not all of them. They take place during the first week of term, before teaching begins, at a time which is very busy and can be a little bit disorientating for students. So we were looking to provide uh, an activity toward the end of that first term for students who hadn't previously been involved to connect with the library team and for students who had taken part in the original tours to experience something new, perhaps challenge some of their ideas of the library. We know that by the end of the first term, most students have had ample opportunity to try and search for resources independently. So they should have a good idea of what they're succeeding in and they may also have a better idea of what challenges they face in tracking down the resources they need. We know there's a really strong interest uh, in escape room and code breaking activities. A Guardian article recently reported there were one and a half thousand escape rooms in the UK and there were multiple commercial escape rooms uh, in the city of Cambridge itself. We also know that different elements of the university have run very successful escape room and code breaking events, such as the main university library and several museums. And there's a real enthusiasm for code breaking within our library team. And I think that's an important point just to say, if you're going to invest time and energy in creating a plot and marketing this to students, it really does help to have some enthusiastic code breakers uh, in your team as well. So what do you actually need if you want to create an escape room uh, within your own library? Well, we ran these escape rooms uh, in person, <clears throat> and so you need space. Uh, it has to be a space that won't impact on other library users. Uh, students can become uh, quite vocal during escape rooms, and so there's quite a bit of shouting and tearing around the place. Uh, we were very lucky to identify a seminar room that's actually a multi-use room that we could set up 
uh, for several days at a time to run the uh, code breaking challenges. But a corridor, uh, a storeroom, uh, and a sectioned off area of the library would all work just as well. I would just say if you're using a multi use space, do be mindful of telling students what is and isn't included in the parameters of the game. I learned this the hard way when one of our students started to try and hack into the fire panel to set the alarms off uh, as part of the escape room. Think about technology. Do you want students to bring their own phones and laptops with them or are you going to provide uh, terminals they can use for searching? We wanted the escape rooms to be as close as possible to their own experiences of searching for resources. So we asked them to bring their laptops, phones or whatever they'd normally use with them. Thinking a little bit about props, commercial escape rooms can be very elaborate. I don't think anyone will expect uh, a revolving bookcase or a smoke machine in play. We probably spent around £60 on a safe and some uh, briefcases and padlocks. Uh, but actually, libraries are themselves fantastic sources of props. Fans, cash boxes, filing cabinets can all be used. Think about how much time you want students to actually invest in these games uh, and how much time you have to spare. We perceived that students were actually very busy throughout the term, so our original games only ran for 30 minutes each, but do allow time between events to reset the room. That takes a lot longer than you would think. Finally, think about how to actually market the, the event. We decided to email all of the students and we had a display in the library for people to find out more. We used Eventbrite as a ticketing system, which allowed groups to book uh, dedicated time slots. And we were very fortunate that all those slots were fully booked within an hour of us releasing the details. They are popular. So what did we actually do? Well, we developed a game uh, called the Courtroom Conundrum. I think it's important to come up with a plot for your game but the plot isn't actually the most important thing. What it will actually drive the game are the clues you give to students. So think about what you want to achieve, whether they're learning outcomes or just things that you want students to know. You can develop the clues around these. So we developed one set of clues around searching for electronic resources. We wanted students to be familiar with the library's legal databases page and then to feel confident logging on to something like Westlaw or Lexus Library to search for the case citations. So we had clues where they had to search the cases and then take details of those cases to, to generate a number. Secondly, we wanted students to be familiar with the layout of the physical library. It's a large space and knowing where to go for which material will save them a lot of time. So we set clues within books the students had to search on the catalogue and they were then directed to those books where they'd find numbers inside. And lastly, we included some general problem solving games. We wanted to keep the game lighthearted and incorporate some of the elements you would find in a commercial escape room. So, for example, we had a scroll which just said time is key and students had to take apart a clock in the room to find a key for a cash box in there. Do think about how, <clears throat> pardon me, um, do think about how you're going to actually follow up on those experiences with students. If you want time after the game, you could talk to them about what worked, what didn't work, and that makes more of a learning experience from it. Okay, so <clears throat> we ran games uh, twice, once in November 2008, and then a second set in December 2009. And having gone through both of those, what have we learned? What worked and what didn't? Well, what we certainly learned is that students like to win. And that perhaps comes as no surprise. In the first round of games that we set up, we gave students just 30 minutes to try and crack the code. And we found that about half the teams weren't successful. This did give us a really good uh, opportunity to connect with them about what they could have done to achieve uh, success, but it also meant the teams were leaving on a little bit of a downer, and we wanted it to be an uplifting experience for them. 
So when we reran the game in December 2019, we factored in some extra time, allowing them 40 minutes and putting a member of the Law Library team as a character in the room. They could then ask that member of the team of the three clues and that allowed us to provide real time support for everyone. It also meant that most of the students were successful in cracking the code and they left feeling like very effective detectives. We also found from feedback that students really like participating with their friends. When we first started the game, we offered an Amazon voucher for any teams taking part, but we quickly found that all the games were fully booked and that students were happy to give up 30 or 40 minutes without any bribery. So we quickly dropped the Amazon vouchers and just carried on with the games. We did find that they are quite time intensive to offer. So a normal tour, we would accommodate around 25 students and it would take half an hour. Uh, we had a team limit of eight participants at a time and it was taking 40 minutes. So do be realistic about whether actually um, a good replacement for tours or whether they're perhaps a better addition to the programme. We found that the games were heavily oversubscribed and we didn't want to be turning people away without an opportunity to connect with them further. So we set up uh, an email list where people could uh, register for updates if they would like. And we also posted, for example, photographs live from the games on our social media to try and engage more people. Essentially, I think they should be thought of as a springboard for further interaction and support rather than an end in themselves. Okay, so looking ahead and just covering some of the next steps that we have. Obviously, we're coming up on a period of relative uncertainty about what teaching and in fact the library environment will look like next term. So one of our main questions are, can these be adapted for virtual delivery as part perhaps of a virtual orientation program? It's also uh, possible to think about whether there's opportunities to issue them in a different format. So I'm very aware that not all students will be confident, even in normal circumstances, taking part in a code breaking game in person with a team of people. There might be opportunities to provide, for example, code breaking challenges by email that people can do independently on their own or share with friends if they would prefer. Before we went into lockdown, we had developed a second plot, if you will, uh, called the probate puzzle. So very much our focus up to this point has been on engaging new students with these games, but it might be a good way to engage returning students in new services that the library has to offer. For example, we'll be trialing reading lists online next year, and so it's a nice format to, become, to try and get students used to using a new resource like that. Either way, I think we can say that there's many, many more mysteries ahead to be solved uh, and lots of opportunities to try and develop these in the future. That's everything from me.